All right, everyone, welcome to session seven of the AP Physics C e &M review. So what are we going to learn today? We are going to review electromagnetic induction. So we're going to begin with our equations review. We're going to define a concept called magnetic flux. We're going to go through Faraday's law and Lenz's law. We'll even talk about induced electric fields, and we'll conclude with Maxwell's equations. Then we'll do our practice, and we'll go to our last, uh, our next testing tip. So here are new equations. Um, in the top right corner, this is the equation for magnetic flux. And I'll talk about that in the next slide. This is Faraday's law in its full form. Uh, these are worthy reminders. This is how we calculated the magnetism due to a little bit of wire. So if you have moving charge, you're going to get magnetism. So that was session five. Um, if you have a moving charge and if you have another magnet, you're going to get a force. So one little bit of moving charge you get a little bit of magnetism. If you have two magnets, that's when something interesting happens. Uh, this is Ampere's law that Eason reviewed um, in um, the last session. And then we also want to remind you that Ampere's law is very similar in concept to Gauss's law. And then you might want to remember how to calculate um, current from a potential difference and resistance. And then this is the form of um, power, electric power on the equation sheet. Um, but what I did is I just substituted in IR. So I, this is how I usually remember power, I squared R. But we also could get rid of current. And this is another way to express power. But only this form is on the equation sheet. OK, so let's talk about flux. The way I think of flux, because I'm a very visual person, is I think of it as the number of field lines passing through an area. Um, and that's actually ridiculous, because there's an infinite number of field lines. We're just, you know, when we draw a field, we're only drawing a set number. And if we draw more, then we're trying to model that it's a stronger field. But I think of it as the number of field lines, just like with electric flux. Um, so if I have a loop of wire oriented in the same direction as a magnet field, this is um, an image that I took from the physics Avery. So the field lines are supposed to be vertical. And the loop is also supposed to be vertical where the sides are facing to the right and left. So since there's no field lines going through that area, they're just flanking the area, there's no flux. However, if we hold the loop like it is shown in this image, now we have maximum flux. So if I have any other angle, there still will be field lines going through it, except for this angle, of course. Um, but it won't be as much as it is when the area of the loop is facing up or down, depending on your perspective. Okay, so if you have flux, you know, I, I like to envision it as the number of field lines, but when you calculate it, it depends on field strength, it depends on area, and it depends on the orientation of the loop. So um, I like this animation. If you, it's showing you the magnetic field lines leaving the North Pole. And so here they're very concentrated. That's the strongest part of the field. And as we get further away, they're further apart. So that's modeling that it's weaker. So um, this is connected to a coil and it makes a complete circuit with a light bulb. And look what happens when we change the flux inside the coil. So we get some light, but only when there's relative movement. And if you go faster, then we see more light. So that's changing the strength of the magnetic field inside your coil. And so as that magnetic field ch strength changes, you're changing the flux. And so you're going to induce a voltage. That's the essence of Faraday's law. OK, another way to change um, the flux of the loop is to change its orientation. So this is another great animation from the physics Avery. So here I have minimum flux. And now I have maximum flux. And as I continue to rotate, I will have minimum or zero flux. So I like this image over here, these sine curves. So when we started the, going back to the beginning, okay, so now we have maximum flux. So looking at this graph, there are two sine curves shown. So when we're at a maximum sine cosine curves, we have, um, this is the flux curve. This is how the flux is varying. And if you notice, Faraday's law says that if you have a change in flux, you're going to induce a voltage. Well, where we have the greatest slope here, that's the greatest change in flux. So that's when our EMF, or induced voltage, is a maximum. OK, so here's another great animation from Physics Avery. So um, it's a little toy tractor. So this time, we're going to change the area of the loop through which 
the flux is changing. So these are conducting rods. This is a light bulb, more conducting rods. And then this metal rod is, is free to move because this little tr toy tractor is going to push it. So the area is getting smaller. Notice how my light bulb's lighting up. So the area is changing now, which means the number of field lines through the loop is changing. My flux is changing. We are going to induce a voltage. We have a complete circuit. So we are going to get a current and we're going to light our light bulb. OK, so when I teach electromagnetic induction, my brain goes through this sequence of events of what is necessary from the moment the flux changed to trying to figure out which way the current will flow if we have a closed loop. So um, this is what I call my sequence of events. If you have a changing flux in a wire, you're going to induce an EMF. That's Faraday's law. If your wire is closed, then you're going to get a current. And the current size will be dependent on the resistance, and that's Ohm's law. But then you have to remember a current is moving charge. So, oh my goodness, we just made magnetism. So we used these two laws to calculate how big that magnetic effect was. Um, and then finally, so we have two magnets now. We had the original magnet, the magnetism in the changing flux, but we induced a voltage, we made a current, we made a new magnet. And so those two magnets cannot work together. Um, otherwise, you're going to totally violate conservation of energy. And I'll try to explain that in the next slide. So there's a lot of words on the slide. I am going to try to talk through and explain, but I encourage you to stop it and read it if you're one of those people that needs to read it to understand it. But Lenz's law basically just says that you're going to get an induced current and a loop of wire from an induced voltage, um, but that induced current is going to have a magnet field around it so that it opposes the original change in flux that created the EMF in the first place. So that is a mouthful. Um, so I gave two examples here. So for example, and I'll try to go through more examples in some of the images I have in, uh, in the slides. If your magnet flux is increasing through the loop in a certain direction, well, you have a change in flux, you're going to induce a voltage, there's going to be a current, and that current's gonna have a magnetic field around it, and that magnetic field is going to try to oppose that change. So if you have a magnetic field increasing, excuse me, a, a magnetic field and whose flux is increasing one way, then the induced magnetic field is going to want to go the other way to oppose the change. Likewise, if you have a loop and you have a magnetic field going one way and it's decreasing, well, you have a changing flux. So you're going to induce a voltage. If it's a closed loop, you're going to have a current. Current's going to have a magnet. So that magnet is also going to be pointed the same way to prevent the change in flux. So here's some, some tips when you're trying to use Lenz's law because it's all over magnetism and EM. Um, determine if the flux is getting bigger or smaller, and also take note of which way the magnetic field uh, from that flux is directed. Then remember that, okay, if we're gonna go through these steps, I'm going to induce a voltage with Faraday's law. It's, if it's closed loop, I'm going to induce a current, and that current has to have a magnetic field that opposes the change. Um, and then lastly, use your right-hand rule to figure out which direction the current is based on which way you think the induced magnetic field should be. Okay, so, this is what my colleague and I call the mammoth slide wire problem. Um, and it's just, there's the, it appears in the, on uh, the AP exams a lot. Sometimes they're vertical, we've seen them on inclines, um, but we try to ask every single question we possibly could. And so pause the video, read through it, um, and we're gonna try to go through each one now. Okay, so the first question asks you to calculate the induced voltage. So you're gonna start off with Faraday's law, uh, the magnet field's going right into the page. The area of the loop right now, this is our conducting area. We have a complete loop here. So depending on your, your vantage point, it's either directed right out of the page because you're looking at that area vector is which way the loop's facing. So it's facing right out at us. And if you were on the other side of it, you could argue it's facing right at you. But still, we don't have to worry about an angle between the magnetic field vector or the area vector. So when we look at the time derivative, uh, after defining what flux is, the magnetic field's not changing. So I pulled it out of the derivative. And so then I looked at, um, yeah, as this thing moves to the right, the area is going to change. Um, so then I defined some variables. You know, in the, on the previous page, it said that the distance between the wires was L. So I just decided to call this distance S for Sheila. No, I'm kidding. S is often used for distance. So now I have area defined as L times S. L's not changing as this bar moves to the right, but S from here to here will. So what is 
the, the um, time rate change of position? Well, that's velocity. And so since the first question asks you to find what the induced voltage is at t equals zero, well, t equals zero, that is my initial velocity. Then the next question said to find um, the current. So you're gonna use Ohm's law. So don't forget induced voltage, it's a voltage. It's just a fancy way of saying like, it's perfect pure voltage. Um, so I used Ohm's law. I plugged in um, what I found for part A and I was able to get the direction of the current. Now here's a chance for us to practice Lenz's law. As this bar moves to the right, the area enclosed by our loop is getting bigger. So we have an increasing flux into the page. So the current that is induced has to have a magnetic field around it that's gonna oppose this change. So the induced field is gonna be out of the page. So then you use your right hand rule and you can see that your current is counterclockwise. Uh, the next part said, okay, everyone, we have a current flowing through here and it's going counterclockwise. We have a current that's moving charge in a magnetic field. Oh, so now it's exciting. Now we have two magnets to play with. So there's gonna be a force on our moving rod. Um, and interestingly enough, I just know something from capital I to lowercase i. I do that all the time, but it's still the current that we just found. Um, so it's a cross product. And um, the um, direction of the L is the direction that the current's moving. And that's perpendicular to the magnetic field because we're talking about the current moving in this bar. So we can get rid of our um, cross product um, by doing the magnitude of the first, magnitude of the second, and then there is a 90 degree angle. And then what I did here is I substituted in the expression that we found for the current right here. Again, noting that I went from uppercase i to lowercase i. I I've sort of changed through the years. Okay, so let's look at the next one. Oh, and as far as direction. So with direction, you're gonna use this right-hand rule. Like, you remember the force psh, coming out and I'm um, knocking you on the forehead. So your fingers are gonna go into the page for magnetic field. The current in the bar is going to the top of the screen. So your palm is facing to the left. So I wrote down, we're going left. All right, so next one, um, you're now asked to find the acceleration. So we're gonna get into the calculus party as, as I love that Eastman calls it. So whenever you're asked to solve for acceleration and they just ask you to solve for force, really good idea to use Newton's second law. So I plugged in the value that we found in the last part. And as this particle, or excuse me, as this rod moves to the right, we just found that the force can be the left. So this thing is going to slow down. So um, I plugged in the force that we found and then I was like, oh dear, I've got a problem because as the velocity changes, my acceleration is going to change. And we're not going to do multivariable calculus in this class, but we can express acceleration in terms of the, the time rate change of the velocity. So I got, when I do that, I need to get my one changing variable on the same side as my differential. And I need to get all the other stuff on the other side. So I did that here. And I started off with velocity VO, don't forget your bounds. And I'm looking for the velocity at any time t. So those are my bounds. And the problem said that we started at uh, time zero. So I'm going to go to time t. Um, so doing all this calculus party stuff, you know, look on your math cheat sheet. This is the natural log of velocity. So I did that. And um, I, I noted here that um, the natural log, when you plug in your bounds, it looks like this. But there's really cool little math trick where the difference of these two is the same as um, the quotient of the, you know, natural log of the quotient. So when you have that, we want to solve for V um, and that's inside my, my natural log expression. So, you know, as, as my students will say, you got to E it. So you got to E both sides. And when you um, E when uh, the right side, then the natural log goes away. It's not going to go over here, which is why this expression looks so ugly. So when you solve for the velocity any time T, just multiply your initial velocity to the other side. And there you go. Kind of a yucky looking answer. But what I love about exponential decay and growth is that if you plug in like the extremes, so if you plug in t equals zero, e raised to the zeroth power is one. So it's saying at time zero, our initial velocity is vo. We already knew that, so that's nice. It worked out. Um, and then a long time later, um, <clears throat> we're gonna plug in infinity. So that's like saying one over e to infinity. So that's zero. So yeah, eventually we're gonna stop. <laughs> so that makes sense. So um, exponential decay is this nice little curve here. Um, and uh, I had a professor in college who said, you know, when you have exponential growth or exponential decay, the majority of what happens happens right away. So we are gonna have a steeper slope initially, and then we'll have a less steep slope. All right, let's go to the next one. So now, <laughs> now I make you do more calculus party. So this next one was asking to solve for the position as a function of time. 
So I was like, oh dear, I have this expression for velocity, but I know how to express position, excuse me, velocity is the time rate change of position. So I did that and I was like, all right, well, I'm just gonna get DT over there. So now I just do some calculus. So the problem stated that we were starting um, at XO equals zero. And so we wanna know where we're gonna end up. So those are my bounds for my differential DX. And I, you know, I remind my students all the time, especially those who are new to calculus, whenever you see a D, it just means a tiny little bit. So we are adding up all those tiny little bit changes in position. And we're gonna do the same thing over here in tiny little increments of time. Um, use your math cheat sheet. That's the third page of um, the tables of information and equation sheets, which you are given. Um, so I actually love doing integrals of um, derivatives and integrals. Uh, excuse me, I love doing uh, derivatives and integrals with uh, exponents because either you're multiplying by all the garbage in the exponent or you're dividing by it. So, um, so it's an integral. So this is, and then you have your original expression. So here's my original expression and then I'm dividing by all the garbage. Um, so we're gonna go from zero to any time T. Um, and so when you plug in your bounds and just look through this closely and uh, this is what you're gonna get, which is even uglier <laughs> than your last expression. So it's almost better, I think, to, um, to think about like what's going on. You know, the bar was initially moving and it's gonna slow down, you know, initially very quickly and then it's going to have this gradual slowing down so um so this is what an exponential growth graph looks like you know referring back to the professor when you have exponential growth or decay the majority of what happens happens right away so we're gonna do most of the change in our position and then we'll slowly change our position as time goes on and again i love putting in t equals zero and t equals infinity um i did put um, a t equal infinity just to we can see the where we were approaching you know the problem said we were starting at x equals zero um, so at t equals infinity this is what this really ugly expression becomes so if you're asked to label the asymptotes in a graph which you usually are then you can um, the next one this is uh marginally less ugly um, again from your velocity as a function of um, time ex uh, expression you want acceleration, so acceleration is related to velocity. You're going to take the time derivative of the velocity function, um, and here's what you get, which looks, you know, not so great. But anyway, if you plug in t equals zero, we know eventually we're going to stop, and there's going to be no more acceleration. So if you plug in t equals zero, then if you're asked to label the initial acceleration of the bar, you can. Uh, by the way, this is the same approach you would take um, for an object falling through air, reaching terminal velocity you're going to solve for the velocity as a function of time first. And then from there, you can get the acceleration as a function of time and the position as a function of time. OK, so then you're asked to calculate the power generated in the resistor. So um, I told you that my favorite power equation is I squared R. I don't know why, <laughs> but that is the one I decided to use. So I also noted what power is. Power is the rate at which energy is consumed. So I solve for energy, and I have this expression. And then I realized, oh, dear, I have a problem because power is I squared R and I is changing like crazy. So what I did is I, I noted that I'm gonna have to do some calculus. I, I can't just say it's a, you know, a constant value for a certain amount of time. So what I did is I, I said, okay, I'm gonna try to find this power function and I'm going to look at tiny little intervals of time. So I noted down here, I mean, this looks a little scary, what we solved for the current as a function of time. But then I was like, oh dear, we had an expression for the velocities of function of time. So then I noted what that is. So here's an expression for my current as a function of time. Now here's what I thought was so totally cool the first time I did this. When I went and did my little calculus party and you know it looks so ugly, there are so many letters here, um, but you're basically, you have all constants except for time. So, and you have an exponential function. And I love those because either you divide by all the garbage in the exponent or you, you multiply it. So it's an integral. So I, I pulled down everything that was constant here. I have my exponent just the way it's written here. And then I have one over, I keep calling it garbage, but this is really scary. There's a lot of letters. Um, I have all those letters in the denominator. And then it's amazing. All of these variables start canceling out. So the B squareds, the L squareds, the R, and then I was like, okay, I'm gonna plug in from zero to infinity. Cause that's what the question was asking is what is the um, total energy consumed um, in the resistor? And so then I had this and, and one over e to infinity is zero and e to zero is one. And so, oh my goodness, 
the energy dissipated was one half MVO squared. And that's like, woo, you know, cause that's conservation of energy. Initially in this problem, the only thing moving was the rod and the rod only had kinetic energy. So conservation of energy at its finest after all those letters. Okay, um, now here is something crazy that when I, um, I started teaching this course about 10 years after I graduated from college and my mind was like, goodness gracious, I forgot about this stuff. Um, so with Faraday's law, so here's another example of, um, I made this picture, it's not great. It's a, um, a circular region with a magnet field directed into the page. So let's practice another lenses law right now. Let's say the magnet field was getting smaller. So inside this copper ring, the magnet field is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So we have a copper ring. So we have a changing flux inside the ring that's going to induce a voltage in the ring, which is going to create a current depending on the size of the resistance in the ring. And so which way is the current? So let's think about it. And by the way, the current is going to have a magnet field surrounding it. And so the direction of the current is going to be dependent on, upon that induced magnetic field. So going through Lenz's law, if the, the magnet field is, is decreasing into the page, then the, the induced magnetic field uh, surrounding the copper wire is going to be like, whoa, that's decreasing. I have to oppose that change. So the induced magnetic field is going to be into the page, which then using right-hand rule, if you put your fingers into the page, kind of looks like that, and put your thumb in the, uh, your thumb's going to be in the direction of the current. So in this case, it would be clockwise. Um, but here's the crazy thing. In order to have a current, you need something to push the current. Um, when we were in electrostatics, we said the electric field inside of a metal is always zero. Well, we don't have static charges here. We have moving charges, which means something has to push them. And so that something is an electric field. But here's the crazy part. We don't actually have to have the copper ring there. We're still gonna get an electric field that is circular in nature that would push charges here if there were charges there. Um, but if we take away the copper ring, there isn't. So this is the full statement of Faraday's law. Uh, we can look at the electric field that's gonna be induced even if we don't have an object there to induce a current in it. So I thought I would do a sample problem. These questions don't appear often, but they sometimes do. So I'm using the full form. I, I made this problem up, the full form of Faraday's law. And I want us to find the electric field strength at a distance little r when we have this magnetic field that is um, changing with time. So here's an expression that I made up for how the magnetic field is changing. Um, so here we go. We can argue by symmetry, once again, that whatever the electric field is, we can pull it out of the integral. And by the way, this is a dot product, but since the electric field is going, um, uh, let's just say it was going clockwise for the sample that I did on the previous screen. If the electric field is going clockwise, we're moving in the same direction as the electric field, uh, very similar to a magnet, um, amp magnetic fields with Ampere's law. So since these two vectors are in the same direction, there's always going to be a zero angle between them. So that's the first step in doing calculus is get rid of your vectors. Um, when you pull the electric field out of the expression, in my head, this says add up all the tiny little lengths you traveled along the ring of radius r. Um, and I, I shouldn't say ring, along the circle, because we took away any ring or any, any metal object that would push a current through it. So that's just 2 pi r. Um, now, on the other side of the equation, um, and by the way, notice how I dropped the negative sign, because they're going to ask you which way the induced field is, is directed or which way the induced current is flowing. So I very often blow off the negative sign, and so does the College Board, because uh, again, they're going to ask you conceptually if you understand what's going on. Um, so the area of my um, the region where my magnetic field is changing is, is not changing. It's the magnetic field that's changing. So since flux is equal to field strength times area. I don't need to worry about orientation because my field is directed right into the page and the area that I'm looking at is facing um, the same direction. So I'm going to go ahead and take the derivative of this function that I made up. And so on the left side of my equation, I have electric field strength times two pi r. And on the right side, well, the area of my magnetic field is pi uppercase r squared. And the derivative of this expression is six t squared. So um, I, Put an example here, let's say I wanted to know what was going on at one second. So I didn't state that up here, but I'm telling you now, I want to know what was going on in one second. So all I did is I just plugged in one for time. And so now I have an expression for that electric field strength. All right, let's try the next slide. Okay, so Maxwell's equations. Um, basically the pinnacle of this course is they want you to see that 
electric fields induce magnetic fields and magnetic fields induce electric fields. And it just uh, points us in the direction of this amazing phenomenon called electromagnetic waves. Um, so the four Maxwell's equations is Gauss's law. So um, here's a point charge and here's a Gaussian sphere that I drew. And so this is Gauss's law. Um, now there actually is a Gauss's law for magnetism. So what I did over here is um, I use a shutterstock image of a magnet and then I drew in um, a sphere. Now, if you notice, some of the field lines don't ever leave the sphere, but others that le uh, leave, they come back in. So the net flux through a spherical shape, um, you know, mimicking um, Gauss's law of electricity, the net flux is zero. So that is one of Maxwell's equations. And basically it's trying to um, bring home the idea that um, magnetic field lines always make closed circular loops, whereas electric field lines can radiate inward and outward. Um, so then we talked about Faraday's law and you saw this animation from FET. Um, so that's a third of Maxwell's equations. And then you may recall from Easton's video, this is Ampere's law, but it's called the Ampere Maxwell for real because Ampere, excuse me, Maxwell added this part and I grade it out because it's not typically, um, I've never seen this part of the, um, of the expression on the AP exam and it's not on your equation sheet. But basically Maxwell, when we're gonna go into this in the next slide, oops, uh, Maxwell found a problem with Ampere's law. Um, if you have a capacitor that's charging and if you, there's an electric field in between the capacitor plates. Um, so if you drew an Ampere loop inside that electric field, there's, there's a small problem here because there is, um, there's no current in there. And that's what Ampere's law says. However, there will be a magnetic field um, induced from that changing electric field. So that was a problem. So basically um, this expression, epsilon naught, um, the rate of change of electric flux um, with respect to time, this is something that like, you know, for us, I always use the example of what's going on in capacitor. So this is, it's called drift current. Um, and you're not gonna see it, but you do need to know that if you have a changing electric field, you are going to induce some magnetism. Um, okay, you can ask your teacher more about that if you're curious. Okay, so there is an amazing song from a group of professors um, and they, um, they explained Maxwell's addition to Ampere's law. And so I included the lyrics here and I will include the lyrics um, in the, the folder with more resources for you. Um, and it's worth reading the whole sheet. I only include the, the top part. Um, and it's definitely worth listening to the song. It'll make you smile. Okay, so as I said, the pinnacle of the course. And um, this is uh, taken from old physics. Um, uh, there's an animation of how an electromagnetic wave propagates. Oops, I lost my cursor there. Right here. Okay, so whoa, kind of crazy. So I'll let it stop so our eyes can like relax. But um, the this this red area right here, that 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 um, think of that area vector pointed up or down. The green arrows are a changing electric field. So if we have a changing electric field inside this area, then we're going to get some magnetism. Same deal with the this green area here. This is, I guess we could say kind of like vertical with the screen. And we have a changing magnetic field, and that's Faraday's law, inside that, that region. So that's an electromagnetic wave. A changing electric field will induce a magnetic field. A changing magnetic field will induce electric field. And they're, they're going to be perpendicular to one another based on how we defined each of Maxwell's equations. All right, let's review. So these are the essential knowledges from the College Board. And Yes, a changing magnetic field can make a current, uh, 100%. Um, so induced forces can change the kinetic energy of the object. That the slide wire generator, um, the slide wire generator is going to slow down even if it's frictionless due to the interaction of um, the, the, the magnetic field with the, the loop the, of uh, current flowing. Um, yes, we use symmetry and calculus again. We had, a, we had a big calculus party in honor of Eastman. Um, and then yes, this is the pinnacle of the course. An electromagnetic wave is the result of changing electric fields, making magnetic fields that are changing and vice versa. All right, let's practice. 
Okay, so this is a lot of text over here. I would encourage you to stop me talking, like just say stop <laughs> and read it if you if if the explanation doesn't work for you. But basically, choice you've got two um, current carrying wires, and they're carrying current the same way. And um, if you think about it, they're both going to have a magnetic field that is going one way or the other way. So if you use your right hand rule right now through the center of the loop, um, if I choose loop P and I put my thumb to the top of the screen, my magnetic field is going to be going to my left. Same thing with Q. Um, and it's going to be strongest at the center of each loop for, due to each current. So if you bring them closer together, you're going to be increasing the flux in both of them. So the, both loops are going to respond by wanting to induce a current the other way. So this is the only one that suggests that. Uh, the first one says, if you bring P towards Q, uh, well, that is going to create a, an increase in flux in Q. So Q is going to respond by creating a magnetic field in the opposite direction and therefore a current in the opposite direction. Um, same deal here. This is going to this is going to decrease the flux if you take away the current. Um, so it's not going to go in the opposite direction. Q is going to freak out that the flux is decreasing inside of it. So it's going to respond by um, having a magnetic field that will be in the same direction that, that P once was offering it. Now for these last two, uh, I think it's easy to visual visualize with straight wires. Um, I used to have this silly expression that I use with my students that opposites attract, you know, positive and negative charges attract. So opposites attract, except when you're talking about current carrying wires. Um, so however you want to remember that, or if you actually want to go through it, I, I gave an example here. I, um, I have a blue wire. And so if you use right hand rule, thumb to the top of the screen, the field is going into the screen on the right. It's going to come out of the screen on the left. And then I placed another wire in there, the red wire. So now I'm going to use this rule. So if you put your fingers into the page, the current struck to the top, the force is indeed to the left. So it's attracting the blue wire. Um, and so both of these are, um, are saying, you know, this one should attract, this one should repel. And if you want to go through it here, I did the same thing. I started with my red wire and I drew my field around it. So you see a red field. And then I place the blue wire there. And if you go through the same process, you're going to see that both wires will attract because they have to, due to Newton's third law, they're going to attract with equal and opposite forces. OK, so um, I like this question because sometimes I notice my students um, space out a little bit when you're asked to solve for a rate. But that's what you're asked to solve for here. So I started off with Faraday's law. And again, guys, at any point you need me to stop talking to read a question, please do. Um, so I started off with Faraday's law, and that voltage is going to make a current. Um, it is not the area that's changing. It's the magnetic field that was changing with time, and that's what you're asked to solve for. OK. Um, you know, I told my students not often do they have the magnetic field not go through the loop either um, in the same direction as the area of the loop. So in this case, the area of the loop, it's facing up. But sometimes they do. So you have to know that the area vector is up and that when you do flux, it is the angle between these two vectors. So if the area vector is up and my magnetic field is this way, then I don't want the 30 degree angle. So I'm certain that one of these distractors is if you use the 30 degree angle. Um, OK, so this next one, uh, I love these little calculus questions they give. They want to know how the magnetic field, uh, how it will be proportional if your um, induced EMF is, is varying linearly with time. So I started off being like, OK, how do I do this? Uh, maybe I'll just define induced EMF and flux, because that's what they wanted. And so I solved for flux, because I know that flux is directly proportional to the magnetic field. So then I was like, all right, well, I'm just going to make up a constant. I called it K. So I said, if the induced EMF equals some constant times T, then I plug that in for my induced EMF. And then when you integrate, you have a T squared factor along with these other constants. So that's why I chose that one right here. OK, um, I loved the animation of the loop spinning um, in the uniform magnetic field earlier in um, the session, um, because it, it can help you solve so many questions that um, you know, uh, you can help you solve so many questions that you may not know where to start. But uh, they're saying here that this loop is going to be, it's going to spin at a constant rate around its diameter. So right now, I see maximum flux. The field's coming right, right out at us. The loop is facing towards us. So I just quickly made a little graph here. And when it's spinning at a constant rate, you're going to see a sinusoidal curve. So I made as best as I could a sinusoidal curve. And I'm going to have maximum flux after this loop changes 180 degrees. So then I figured, OK, when am I going to have maximum EMF? 
well, it's going to be where my slope is the greatest. So this is the first time after we start spinning. Okay, let's try a practice problem. So pause, look at this. We, um, we have a current flowing this wire. It is changing linearly. And then we have another loop. Okay, so let's keep going. All right, so the first question is a Lenz's Law question. So since my current is decreasing, you know, plug in numbers, zero seconds, put in one. Okay, it's not smaller. So my current is decreasing, which means the magnet field surrounding this wire is decreasing. So use this right hand rule, put your thumb to the right and your fingers above the wire are coming out at you. So the magnetic field inside the loop of wire with the light bulb is decreasing out of the page. So the loop of wire now says, oh, no, 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 that's not gonna happen. So the current in the loop of wire with the light bulb is going to, um, the induced current is gonna be in a direction so that its magnetic field is gonna be out of the page. So if you now put your fingers for the loop of wire, have your fingers go towards you, pick a spot, and it's gonna be going counterclockwise. All right, so now um, they wanna know what's gonna to happen to the brightness of the light bulb. Uh, Faraday's law says that we get an induced voltage when the flux changes. It doesn't say that we get a changing voltage when the flux changes, and this flux is changing linearly. So that means I'm inducing a constant voltage um, and therefore a constant current. So my, my brightness is gonna stay the same. Okay, so now we get to do some math. Um, so we're trying to find the magnet field at t equals zero. So we're talking about this uh, long straight wire now. So I'm gonna use Ampere's law. Technically, you probably could figure out how to use Biosphere law with it, but it's really ugly in the calculus. So I would not recommend it. I would use Ampere's law for a long straight wire. Um, so when the magnet field circulates the wire, we are going to move in tiny little displacements in the same direction as that magnet field. So our dot product is gonna go away and I can pull my B out of the integral. And so then I'm just left with the, uh, the line integral um, of ds. And so the length of that is just gonna be two pi r. Um, the current enclosed at t equals zero is just I naught. So I solve for my magnetic field strength. Then they want you to figure out the flux. Now this is a little bit, uh, a little bit trickier only because um, the flux is changing at a constant rate. However, the flux at this point depends on the magnetic field a distance d away, whereas the flux at a distance d plus a away is gonna be smaller because I'm further away from the wire that's creating the magnetic field. So I still start off by saying, okay, I know my magnetic field's coming out of the page. Um, my loop is facing at me, so my dot product's gonna go away. And so then I decided to call the area of my loop b, and I, I could, if they didn't use it as a variable, I could say little chunks of parts of A, but you don't want to use your differential. You don't want to use a constant that was given to you. So I just said, okay, look, I'm going to be getting a distance R that makes sense because that's what I, how I expressed it with uh, part C. So I said, this was the area of my loop. And then I said, I wanted to be looking at the area from D to D plus A. So that's where I got my bounds. Then I plugged in my expression for the magnetic field strength but we're doing this at any time t. So I, I plugged in the full expression. Now I'm looking this per second everywhere. <laughs> so everything can come out of, um, out of the integral except for dr and r. So I did that here. I integrated. And again, I went from d to d plus a. And so when you use that cool little natural log trick, um, the difference of the two becomes the same as the natural log of the quotient. So there was the expression I got for that. And then ease on the next page, the power dissipated. This answer is really ugly, um, but still sometimes you gotta do ugly ones because sometimes they ask it. Um, so I decided to um, solve for um, the induced voltage using Faraday's law. And I used the flux that I found on the previous page, which was icky. You might wanna go back and, and verify that I'm not making this up. Um, but I'm looking at this as time, you know, I'm doing the time derivative. So the only expression that has time is this one. Everything else is a constant. So what I did is I was like, okay, this looks really ugly. I'm gonna pull this constant in front of my derivative. That's what I did right here. You don't have to show all this work. I just was trying to provide some guidance as, you know, boom, what's on my screen. Um, so then I'm just left with this expression here, which is this expression here. These are all constants. So the time derivative of a constant is zero. And so the time derivative of this this is t to the first power, power rule, you're just gonna get rid of t. So here was my induced EMF. 
Now, if I wanted to, I could have found my induced current because I told you my favorite expression for power is I squared R, but I thought I'd branch out a little bit. And so I used um, potential difference squared over R. So I, I'm using the expression. This is the potential difference. This is the voltage. Um, I squared that over R and that was my final answer. Um, and I did want to note to you again, what was on the equation sheet. This is the expression on the uh, equation sheet. However, if you plug in Ohm's law, you can, uh, you can get this manipulated form. All right, what should we take away? So what I just put here basically is that sequence of events, because you gotta be thinking about all those steps as you solve through these problems. So yes, first you have a changing magnetic flux, you're going to induce a voltage. And if you have a closed loop, um, a current will be induced and that's Ohm's law. If you have a current induced, holy cow, we've got another magnet. And that magnet is not going to work together with the magnet that first caused the change in flux. Um, I suppose one more point we could add here is we don't actually need the loop there as we saw with induced electric fields. Even if there's no wire there, you're still inducing an electric field that would push charges if there were a wire there. Okay, so exam tip number seven, um, read the question. Draw diagrams. Um, whenever I see test papers from students and they're turning in multiple choice and there's no diagrams, no equations written down, I'm like, how are you guys doing this in your head? So you want to label pictures. If there isn't a picture, you want to draw one. You want to write down, you know, quick equations that you think might be applicable. You want to try to manipulate them algebraically. Don't try to do it in your head. Um, also, when you're trying to um, think about like what's going to happen, like visualize what's going on with the current and visualize what impact that's going to have, for example, in the slide wire bar. The slide wire bar. Um, so really try hard to visualize what's going on as you try to answer a question. Um, and I liked her. I think I want to be a princess. Okay, so that is all. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for watching and please stay tuned for the Amper Long Song.